Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, today I have a perfume talk, we'll call it. I'm not going to call it a review, and I'm not really going to call it a comparison because I'm comparing a version that I have in my collection to a decant that was sent to me very kindly by one of my subscribers, Pyro. Um, thank you very much, mate. I got two of these, actually, and I've been giving it, I've been testing it and giving it, um, aware. This is the second time I've worn it, uh, but the first full wear for the day, I'm calling this my scent of the day. And even though the late dry down, it's about eight hours in, is absolutely fantastic. It's where you get this smoky, um, you know, this, this, this brilliance really this is a Shifra fragrance and the fragrance we're talking about is the one and only Rochas Femme you guys see that I can't see if you can see it I'm like peeking out from the side Rochas Femme um don't let the name Femme scare you if you are a guy uh I promise this is proper unisex uh, it is a fruity chifra. Um, there are some other fruity chifras that were released from men recently that have taken off like wildfire. Aventus is a fruity chifra. Um, so this is a fruity chif. And, um, it was initially, uh, released in 1944, I believe, um, by the great, the master, um, you know, almost like the godfather of modern perfumery, um, Edmund Rudnitska, who also happened to be the teacher of the great um, Pierre Bourdon. And then Pierre Bourdon went on to be the teacher, the uh, the master, the gray beard of um, Julien Rasconet and Jean-Christophe Hero, and I think maybe even a, a female perfumer, he said. I don't remember her name, though. Um, so he's gone on to pass that tradition that Edmund Rudnitska passed down to him. And um, this scent, um, if you've never smelled Rochas Femme, even in the current iteration, it is a fantastic Chifra fragrance. It's up there with the best. The reason that I'm doing this video today is yesterday was my birthday and I wore one of my favorite Chifra fragrances of all time which is Roja's Diaghilev. And Diaghilev borrows from a couple great fragrances. I guess I should be prepared in the future, but I'm gonna reach back anyway, so you guys just entertain yourselves. Uh, it borrows from a couple other chifras. Well, number one is Roja's Femme. It definitely borrows from Roja's Femme. Most people say it borrows from Mitsuko, which it definitely does. But I think the twist is it also borrows from Bandi, which is also a Shifra, proper leather Shifra fragrance. So here's three Shifras that Diaghilev borrows from. And uh, Diaghilev is almost like a blend of the three to my nose, but I absolutely love it. And uh, it's one of my favorite wares. I never get tired of Diaghilev. It always keeps me interested. Some people may take offense to the name, um, you know, using Diaghilev uh, to sell fragrance, maybe put some people off. Putting the price of the perfume at $1,000 a bottle also probably put some people off, um, but the fragrance itself is absolutely stunning. And um, I think it's my favorite Schieffer of all time. Um, but that being said, Rocha's Femme, and Mitsuko are in that upper crest, that top tier Shifra qual, you know, in my mind anyways, that upper crest of Shifras. Um, and I'm just gonna put Bandi back. Okay, so uh, what is Rocha's Femme? Well, first of all, my bottle is a Parfum de Toilette bottle, which is before they, before the industry really um, settled on agreed terms as to what to call a concentration of eau de parfum or a concentration of eau de toilette. They used different terms back then. Like, for example, um, opium by YSL, they called their eau de parfum 
secret de parfum. Um, and Dior called their X-ray a spree de parfum. A spree de parfum. Before they had X-ray and, and all that good stuff. Um, you know, parfum concentration, all that good stuff. So, um, long story short, is this is a late 80s or early 90s bottle. I don't know exactly which. Um, but what ended up happening, according to Parfumo, um, Olivier Cresp reformulated this in 1989 for the modern age. And what I've done is I've been wearing this version, by the way. I guess I should be a better storyteller. This version, I even fill you guys in on the details, and I'm just going off. Um, this version came out, or, or came from a bottle that Pyro, one of my subscribers, found in an estate sale, if I'm not mistaken. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, Pyro. And uh, he got a great deal on it. A huge bottle, like a 200 ml or something from way back when. And um, it's from the 50s or 60s, we think. Uh, he sent me a whole breakdown. You should see the email chain that he sent me. Notes that he gets to his nose as he wears it. Different iterations of um, Rochas's bottles. And, um, you know, back in the old days when it used to actually say Marcel Rochas, um, the full name of the chap who founded the brand. And Rudnitska did a couple fragrances for him. He did Rochas Femme. He did uh, Moustache, uh, Eau de Toilette. Now, Eau de Parfum is a modern fragrance, um, but he did another one as well. So he worked with the brand for a bit. Uh, and, you know, I, I am really not prepared. I'm sorry, but I'm going to bring this out anyways uh, because he also did this. He did Eau de Hermes in 1951. And... Sorry for the noise. Eau de Hermes uh, is my favorite Rudnitska fragrance because it clashes um, this dirty cumin uh, with citruses. And I feel like I can wear this anytime. I wear this in summer, honestly. Uh, but the version I have is the, um, it's the pewter cap is what they call it. There's a pewter cap, copper cap, and then a black cap is the most recent iteration. The pewter cap is the first one, and that's the one that this flacon uh, is based on. And then also the copper cap is very good. Thomas from Early Greek loves copper cap Eau de Hermes. Um, but for me, I love this one. Uh, I this is this is my Rudnitska. This is my when I think about Edmund Rudnitska, Eau de Hermes is for me. Um, that being said, I greatly appreciate. Uh, Rochas Femme, which came out a couple years before. And smelling the older formulation, I did make notes, as I am bound to do from time to time. Some of this incorporates some things that I feel. Some of it incorporates some things that Pyro said in the email because he gave me some really great insight um, into the fragrance. Uh, and I'm just going to let this settle. Um, while I'm letting that settle, let's talk about the notes. So, in the top, you get apricot, bergamot, peach, plum, and rosewood. So, um, you notice immediately three fruits, apricot, peach, and plum, and it's very fruity. Um, but you also get this the only way I can describe the cumin in Eau de Hermes is it's almost like this airy cumin. And I'm going to spray the more, this is still a vintage, but it's the more modern version. Okay. Um, and I'm going to show you in just a second. But Parfum de Toilette basically is their version of a Eau de Parfum. Uh, and you can see the difference in the juice color. You see how much redder and resinous this looks compared to this ambery golden colored juice that came from the bottle in the 1950s or 60s. And what I will say, now here's where Pyro and I disagree. He wrote me and he said he doesn't think there's any cumin in this, in this version, that there's no cumin, it's civet. And to my nose, um, the 
50s, 60s version of Rochas Femme smells closest. The cumin in Rochas Femme from the 50s and 60s smells closest to the cumin in old Eau de Hermes. This is an old formula back when they only used a couple uh, ingredients. Where are the ingredients? There they are. Um, so, you know, it is... I smell cumin in the opening for sure. Uh, there's also cinnamon. And then you get those citruses, but the cumin most closely reminds me of Eau de Hermes. I don't get the Eau de Hermes comparison with the cumin as much with the later formulation that Olivier Crest did. I almost get this, um, I said amped up, um, more modern fruity opening. There is definitely cumin here. But it smells like there's the addition of synthetics, which, which there probably are, and you actually smell it uh, throughout the day. This one, the um, the 1950s to 60s bottle, smells like maybe like an eau de cologne almost sometimes. It lasts forever, but it doesn't project. I mean, you could, you you really have to uh, get on the area to to get. It doesn't project. This one, on the other hand, projects hugely. I was smelling this off of the crux of my arm all day. Um, so the projection and longevity is amped up because I think there's modern synthetics in this Parfum de Toilette version, which are not present in the 50s to 60s uh, bottle that, that this decant came from. Um, but in the heart, what happens is you get this clove, and Rudnitska loved clove. And so I feel like the clove is a little bit amped up here. Also, you get more aldehydes in the opening here than you do in the more resinous Eau de Parfum. Uh, you don't get so much aldehydes. You get this, um, you get this almost, um, almost like this honeyed, gloopy, fruity. Uh, I wrote plum. Uh, the plum note is increased and it feels like that peach nectary note is also amped up, but it almost feels like it's gloopy fruit. You ever had fruit salad and um, you, you, it, it comes in that syrup. You ever had like cheap fruit salad from like a can? Then it comes in that like syrup from the can. That gloopiness of that syrup in the fruit salad is almost what the fruits smell like in the Parfum de Toilette, and they're, they're way amped up. Uh, here, you don't get the fruits as much, um, but you do get... You almost get this... Um, remember how I said with um, Antaeus Sport, because it didn't have like the myrrh and the more resinous notes, that the castorium felt like it was even more because you could really detect it? Here, whatever it is, I think it's cumin. Um, Pyro thinks it's civet. But either way, there's something that almost feels almost like it's it's amplified a little bit in this 50s, 60s bottle. Even though it doesn't project and reach as far, it's it's much more amplified in this version because it isn't hidden by the synthetics and by that gloopy fruit note. Um, which is beautiful, by the way. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to make it seem like one is better than the other. Actually, part of me, since I already have Eau de Hermes, I think I prefer this version because it, it is a little bit, um, it's a little bit more modern with modern synthetics. It projects a little bit more. Um, and I noticed that... Um, well, we'll get to kind of the dry down later on, but it does feel like, so this one has this heavier concentration to it and candied fruit is the feel. So imagine, um, imagine you have that fruit salad in the gloopy syrup, but then you took them and you, and you dripped them with like a candied topping, almost like you were doing like a candy apple for Halloween, you know? Um, that's, that's what the fruits in here feel like. They feel like this candied fruits. And actually, Pyro mentioned, um, a cherry note or cherry accord, black cherry in this version. 
but I get it here huge. Uh, it even looks like black cherry to me. And um, maybe maybe it's the look playing a trick on my nose, but I get this cherry, candy cherry accord here huge compared to the um, vintage. The vintage, the vintage, um, the vintage feels simpler and more elegant in a way. It's beautiful, but it feels simpler in a way. And and uh, Rudnitska was known for his simplicity. He liked having 10 to 14 ingredients max in a, uh, in a composition. Very simple compositions. Um, you know, people always marvel over how he created fragrances like Eau Sauvage and stuff like that with such simple compositions. And he told... Um, um, Pierre Bourdon, that uh, the reason that is because a nose can only handle so many. So when you throw all this stuff in there, you can only pick out two, three, four, five a chord, you know, notes. That's it. Even the most well-trained noses aren't going to be able to pick out 20 notes. It's, it's not going to happen. So he approached it from the simplicity standpoint. And that really shows in this formula because it really highlights the cumin that I think is there in the opening. And then it highlights this beautiful uh, iris, jasmine, carnation, rose, lang lang. Um, Pyro said mentholated rosemary. I couldn't have said it better. I mean, some of the words he used are spot on. Mentholated rosemary uh, with clove. And the clove is what's amped up in here. Rudnitska loved his clove. Uh, and... It's, um, it's definitely there if you search for it. Um, but it doesn't feel like this big, heavy, baroque chifra. chifra. Like I was saying, Diaghilev, yesterday, um, if you watched my video I made, I talked a little bit about it because it was my scent of the day. And the word that Roja constantly uses is big, baroque chifra. And uh, this is exactly the opposite of what this is to me. There's a lot going on and it's complex, um, but it's complex in a simple way, if that makes sense. It goes through the transitions very methodically. You know, you get the cumin and the fruits, you get the cinnamon, you get the floral, you get the clove, and then in the base, you get this amber, benzoin, oak moss, leather, musk, patchouli, and vanilla. And late in the dry down, I'm talking six plus hours, seven plus hours, you start to get this, um, almost like you can pick out this smokiness that starts to resonate from the base. And that made me think that there was labdanum in here. Uh, even though labdanum is not listed, that kind of smokiness without incense um, in something resinous like this that has benzoin. And remember, I said it started out feeling like an eau de cologne. It starts out a little light and airy, almost like this could easily be worn in any weather, but then it transitions into the base and it stays thin, but the base has this resinous labdanum feel to it. And um, again, Pyro thinks there's no labdanum here. I think there's probably labdanum. I don't know where that smokiness is coming from. It could be something like castorium. There is civet in the base. I don't know the um, the extent of the civet used. I don't know if it's real in a 50s or 60s bottle, um, but it's it's this is definitely twice, maybe even three times the projection. Um, and this is a vintage, like I said, late eighties, early nineties, they stopped using the term parfum de toilette, um, in the, in the middle nineties. So it's not new, uh, but it's not as old as this one. And there's, there's big differences between the two. Um, I would say to a trained nose, you could almost pick out, this is an Edmund Rudnitska creation. If you really knew your stuff, I mean, you really would have to know your stuff to make an educated guess that this was a Edmund Rudnitska, but you could guess it has his, it has his hallmark. It has his calling card. It has his DNA in it. Um, it has that, you know, simple, uh, but you know, you can tell it's, it's a style that he really liked and cared for. And for those of you that don't know, 
Um, Rocha's Femme was supposed to, the whole point of this project was to create something uh, elegant that almost wore like a woman's, it was supposed to smell like a woman's skin, okay? Um, which sounds a little creepy saying it out loud, but um, it was supposed to smell like a woman's skin, naturally, like a, like a, like a natural, you know, woman's skin. And um, I feel like the vintage actually accomplishes that fact better. Better than the better than the newer formulation that I have. Now, uh, I haven't smelled a uh, most recent formulation, although I hear for 20 or 30 bucks, because that's what they go for. You're getting a hell of a fragrance. An, an absolute stunner of a fragrance for 20 or 30 bucks. One of the best value for monies that you can buy. Um, and so you this does remind me of a of a second skin. As does Eau de Hermes. Eau de Hermes wears like a second skin as well. Um, and this one does not. This newer version, the gloopier candied fruit one, almost wears like a... It almost wears like a gourmand. Um, it, it almost feels like it, it, it's starting to go away from that chiffre category and it's starting to go towards gourmand which is fine. I know it's a sheep for you definitely can tell if you know your stuff, you know, you can you can really pick things out and see the accord, uh the sheep for accord. But because of that gloopiness, because of that um that candied fruitiness, it it starts to move towards something a little bit different. So I think Olivier Crest did a great job. Now, by the way, I should mention one other thing. I don't know if this is true or not. I don't know if anyone's been to the Osmotech and can verify this, that this is an Olivier Crest reformulation in 89. But um, Pyro did some research and wrote me kind of like a whole breakdown, like I said. And he wrote in 1989 that Pierre Bourdon is the one that reformulated this. Um, which would be amazing if that's true, because Rudnitska was his master. He, the, the student becomes the teacher almost. Um, I don't know if there's truth to that. Pyro said, take everything I write with a grain of salt. Most of it's true, but some of it might not be. Uh, but if anyone knows for sure, if this is an Olivier Cresp reformulation in 89, do let me know. Um, I would be interested. The last thing I want to talk about is ambergris. Now, in the old days, uh, we're talking the 50s and 60s, we're talking 70 years ago. Um, in the old days, before the earth became overpopulated with people using all the natural resources, they could put real ambergris and stuff like this. Um, it was not uncommon. And the dry down, the dry down gives this um, smoky, this this smoky sparkling sheen it almost feels like um i was gonna say it almost feels like a woman's hand after she smoked a cigarette and maybe put on some um you know some some beautiful like uh scented lotion or something um but I, I I get the feel that maybe there is some sort of some sort of musk, some sort of ambergris um, creating that sparkly sheen in the dry down, and it is beautiful. It's a both of these are absolutely stunning fragrances. I I love them to death. I'm so glad to have a bottle of the Parfum de Toilette. Um, but I'm also very glad to get to try this. One other thing before I go is. Um, Immortel. Oh, and T. Two other things. So Immortel and T are two notes that um, Pyro really hit on when he gave me the breakdown of his couple first wares. He said that Immortel note, um, that Immortel note uh, really stands out. And I've been looking for it. And I'm not getting it as strongly as he is. However, um, if I was to pick one that had an Immortel note, it would be this. If I was to pick one that had some smoky tea, it would be this. 
And so you can kind of see this um, picture I'm painting of the original is a little different than the, the newer bottle. Um, it's not exactly the same. Uh, you know, that, uh, that tropical fruit thing that, that's going on um, is, is really amped up here. And I think that this is much more accustomed to modern noses because of the synthetics. I think that a woman who is, you know, if you think about, um, if you think about all the stuff that women put on during the day, uh, they put on makeup, they put on hairspray, they put on eyeshadow, lipstick, all of that stuff is synthetic. So they're surrounded by synthetic accords all day. And when something is a little more synthetic, it blends right into, um, it blends right into the environment that many women are surrounded themselves with. And that's why um, the fragrances that get the most compliments are not the ones that um, a $500 niche fragrance that uses all naturals. Those, those aren't the ones that get compliments. The ones that get compliments are the synthetic ones. Sauvage, Blue de Chanel, you know, stuff like that. Um also, synthetics project more, and this does have a little bit more of that projection. It has a little bit more of that pleasing to modern noses, let's say. But if you're a discerning gentleman or lady, uh, and you wanted something that was against the grain, that was dry, uh, that was true chifra, this is true chifra, there's no synthetics in this, or if there are, they're early synthetics. They're not the stuff that we're used to, right? Um, and so it's much more natural smelling. If there are synthetics in this, he created it in a way where it smells very natural. And over the decades, from the 40s to the 50s to the 60s, this is a 50s or 60s bottle, we think, um, then they did a great job staying true to the original formula. By the way, um, the bottle is supposed to be reminiscent of a woman's curve. How about that? Um, does that remind you of a woman's curves? Uh, maybe if you, I don't know. Um, but uh, either way, fantastic fragrance. Um, this isn't technically a review. This is just me spouting off at the hip. Um, but I like doing that. You know, ideas come up while I'm just spouting off at the hip. Hopefully this is like talking with a friend about perfume. That, you know, two perfume lovers talking about perfume. Um, and so if you haven't tried Rochas Femme, I highly urge you to. This is one of the greatest Chifra fragrances of all time. Just because Diaghilev is my favorite does not mean that if someone came to me and said, Ramsey, Diaghilev sucks, Rochas Femme is my favorite, I would say, Okay, bravo. You know, it's it's like picking a it's like picking a color. What's your favorite color? Um, people smell different things. People experience scent differently. People at different points of their journey experience scent differently. Um, Ramsey five or six years ago may not have felt the same way about Rochas Femme as he does today. Sometimes it takes time to um, you know fully accept, fully appreciate, fully understand. Um, Right? It takes time to do that. It takes, it takes growth. It takes maturity. It takes understanding. It takes experience. You can't teach experience. Um, and so sometimes that's just what it is. But if you're new in the fragrance journey and you only wear Versace, Eros, Blue de Chanel, stuff like that, get, spend 30 bucks and get a bottle of Rocha's Femme. And um, you will see the difference in the way that a perfume is constructed back in the old days, the attention to detail. Um, even today, the new formulations I understand smell absolutely fabulous. Um, another one is this, Mitsuko. Shifra is my favorite category because it is very complex and it develops during the day. I like perfumes that develop. I like fragrances that start somewhere and end somewhere else. You know, it's almost like um, a life cycle of a person. It starts somewhere and it ends somewhere. And there's a season for everything. There's a season for growth. There's a season for birth. There's a season for death. There's a season for love. There's a season for mourning. 
And Shifras touch so many qualities. They touch so many great qualities in life. Um, it's a splendid fragrance. It's, it's beautiful. And um, I probably didn't do it justice, to be honest with you, because this is from the master himself. Um, and I will be very interested if anyone knows whether this is a Olivier Crest reformulation or Pierre Bourdon. That little line in Pyro's email just really stuck out to me. Just, you know, my, my spidey senses were really tingling on that one. Um, because if it's a Pierre Bourdon reformulation, I mean, you just have to crown, you have to crown Pierre Bourdon. It's the greatest perfumer of all time, I think. Even if it's not, maybe you do anyways. It's so good. Um, so... If you have experience with Roche's Femme, do let me know. Um, let me know your thoughts. I love I love interacting with you guys. I try to respond to every single comment uh, the same day. That's my goal. I want to respond to every single comment. Um, I, I respond to each and every one of you because I love the interaction. And I've said it before. I'll say it again. You don't have to give me a like and a subscription uh, if you don't want to. That's not why I'm here. But it does help with the algorithm. It helps me compete with the big boys. Which, um, I've said, go watch my last video if you want me to hear a rant on that. But I do think channels like mine, Rich Mitch's, are starting to make some waves. There's probably some people from the big brands lurking in the background, wondering what people like us are going to say about their fragrances. Even though a video may only get two, three, four, five hundred views, my, my highest ranked videos are only like, you know, a thousand, 1500 views, um... But even though they're that small, tiny compared to um, the, the grand scheme of things, the big fish, I think some of what we are saying is making waves. And so a like and a subscription helps push that message up. It helps push that message up the ladder. Um, and who knows, maybe we can make a change for the better in the perfume industry. That's my goal because I love perfume. Um, I'm not... I'm not about selling units. Obviously, this was... Uh, I, I applaud Rochas just for even keeping this going. Just like I applaud um, Guerlain for keeping fragrances like Mitsuko going. Um, this is my second favorite Shifra, by the way. And this is my third. So, um, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I hope I did it justice. Let me know your thoughts. Comment down below. And thank you for everyone that wished me a happy birthday yesterday. I really appreciate it. I have the best 100 subscri 800 subscribers uh, that you could ask to begin a channel with, like I've said before. And thank you, Pyro, for sending me this on your dime. It was very, very kind of you. So, cheers, guys. And I'll see you again tomorrow with another video. Bye-bye.